Good morning. I wish to extend a very warm welcome to everyone gathered here this morning and to everyone who is joining us on our online. We're pleased that you could join us this morning and would invite you to come and be with us in person. We'd love to have you here when time and circumstance allow. You are most welcome. Let us now calm and center ourselves as we listen to this morning's prelude. Please join with me in the call to worship this morning as you find it printed in this morning's bulletin. Amidst our doubts and fears, Jesus says, In our turmoil and distress, Jesus says, God has breathed the Holy Spirit on us. Today we are starting a new series of messages, exploring the theme, New Heavens and a New Earth. From the joy of the resurrection on Easter morning, we see something totally new. The bonds of death have been broken. Jesus is risen. God started something new. God spoke to the prophet Isaiah saying, behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. As we move from Easter to Pentecost, we'll explore other things made new, a new peace, a new way of seeing, a new covenant, covenant, and more. In keeping with this theme, we will now sing the first verse of hymn number 377, New Earth, Heaven's New.
I invite you to keep your hymnal open and turn to number 360. 360, speaking of new things, we introduced this song for the first time last week on Easter Sunday, and it will serve as our hymn of the month. It's called Who Are These? And I mentioned last week that it's a little strange because it speaks of the Christian life in third person. It talks about these and they who have seen the Savior. And many of us would identify ourselves within these words, but it's a bit more reflective in that it uses third person language. I also discovered this week that there is more to the song than what you find in the hymnal. The accompaniment edition includes several verses besides the refrain that's printed in front of you. And so I hope that you were able to take a slip of paper or receive one from me that includes the lyrics for two verses. I'm not asking you to sing them today unless you're extremely excited to do that. I am instead going to play through the refrain once and I'll invite you to then sing that refrain with me. And then I will take care of singing the verses in alternation with the refrain. And if you feel inclined, sing along. And if not, then the words are there for you to at least know what it is that I'm singing. And you'll see that the verses lead very well into the refrain. They, they fit together, and I think the song makes more sense as a whole when we have this additional piece. So again, I'll play the refrain once, and then I'll invite you to sing. And you can remain seated for this song.
We will now have our prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of holy peace, we are accustomed to the darkness of our world, accustomed to tragedy, sorrow, and worry. Sitting in darkness and gloom, we are familiar with dim hope. We brood over our troubled lives and wicked world, wondering when you will come in power to bring peace to all hearts and lands. Break the grip of darkness. Let your peace dawn in our hearts. Look with favor upon your people. Grant your blessings to us. Let us with wonder accept the gift of your love. Amen. And now hear these words of assurance as found in Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Beth will now lead us in our praise hymns. Seven, Holy Spirit, come with power, number 57. Now turn with me to number 88, praise to the Lord the Almighty, and if you'll notice, verses 3 and 4 are printed on the facing page, but we will sing all four verses.
We will now take up our offering for this morning. And as we listen to our offering for music, let us reflect upon the multitude of blessings the Lord has given to us and in turn reflect upon the needs of others. The small baskets in the auditory plates are for our mission outreach, which for this month will be forwarded to Youth for Christ, Youth Unlimited. I'll mention before I begin to play the offertory piece that it is a little longer than usual. So I hope you're up for a moment of meditation. It's music by Becky Reeser. I've played some of her works before, and I think that it's worth reading what she wrote about the piece. She writes, this is a moment of introspection. And she's recalling her experience and what she saw in the Mexican Caribbean, where seaweed thickly carpeted the sea. It ebbed and flowed, its chunks constantly moving, yet never going anywhere. I noticed that I knew exactly how that felt. And I think that speaks a little bit to what we've heard this morning between the tension between singing praise to God and expressing joy eternal, which is the title of this morning's prelude, and also waiting for the Lord. Sometimes it feels that we are still waiting for that moment and moving but not necessarily going anywhere, and that can be a reality during the Easter season too.
God of abundance, your wholeness surrounds us. Your grace sustains us. In giving our gifts, may we share your peace with others. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning is found in the Psalms number 118, verses 14 through to 17. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Here ends the reading. I'll lead us on our next hymn. Fourteen. Now thank we all our God, number 114. Through to 31. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the door disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see, it, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger in here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here ends our scripture reading. May the Lord open our ears to hear and our hearts and minds to understand as joy brings us today's message. Good morning. Beautiful weekend we're having. Hopefully uh, many of you have been able to get outside or will have a chance to do that. Happy Easter as well. We are um, following along, if you're following along with the traditional church calendar, for seven Sundays, uh, it is Easter. An article in the Orlando Sentinel explains that the church prolongs the celebration of Easter for seven Sundays because the resurrection of Christ is so powerful, it's impossible to combine the wonderful news of his rising from the dead to one Sunday. I think we sometimes get our celebrations over and done with, and I think it's, it's good to be reminded um, to sit in those spaces sometimes and to really linger on the meaning of them and to continue being joyful um, because Jesus is alive. This season, Eastertide lasts for 50 days. As expressed by the Anglican Compass, in the church year, this is quite literally 50 days of feasting. It's the high point of the church year. So it makes sense we would party for so long. After all, the main point of the whole gospel is to prepare us for an eternal celebration and feast. Today's passage opens on a scene in which the resurrection is not yet confirmed or widely known, and so the characters in our story at the beginning here are not in the mood for feasting. It's a little bit more like a, a horror or thriller movie in which the characters have actually barricaded themselves into a building, hoping against hope that whomever or whatever is out to get them can't find them, can't break in or seep through the walls, um, of course, in a, in a horror movie, there's usually the added tension of uh, babies that might cry at any moment or phone notifications that might give away your location or something that drops onto the floor and makes a noise. Stories like that that play on our fear tend to do so in exaggerated ways with ghosts and monsters and other larger-than-life characters and situations that we have to overcome. Despite their fantastical themes, uh, many of the behaviors demonstrated are rooted in human tendencies. As much as we groan and maybe kind of yell or talk to the screen, telling the characters to make smarter choices in these stories, uh, for instance, hiding is part of what's known as the freeze response, an instinct that can take over when we're afraid. And there's a reason for that. 
A Wiley University article on physical fear responses explains that fear starts in the brain and the physical effects throughout the body help us adjust so we can have the most effective response to a dangerous situation. On an instinctual level, our body is preparing us to fight or flee. The brain triggers a release of stress hormones. The freeze response, they say, is rooted in our response to keep us hidden from a predator. We hide when we feel threatened, when there's unrest and our safety and well-being are at risk. Hiding might be physical, but it could be social and behavioral, such as not checking or responding to messages or keeping emotional distance from other people, and even in the image we carefully craft and present to the world. We hide for lack of peace, and also in some superficial way to find it. Ultimately, though, when our fear goes into hiding with us, there isn't any peace there, is there? And as we and our fear hang out alone together in the dark, doing nothing, going nowhere, we're just hoping not to be found. That's not much of a life, though, is it? But how do we gain courage, perspective, or freedom from the threats we perceive so that we can unlock the door and get back out into the open? John 20 offers some hope, showing us that Jesus' peace and presence moves us from fear and doubt to joy and boldness and living out in the open and sharing the good news. Walking through John 20 together, let's look at different pieces of the story in sequence and then see how they all come together. The opening verse in the section provides context for the scene. It takes place on the evening of Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. As far as the disciples knew, Jesus was dead. There are a couple of layers here. One, their closest friend and companion was gone. Their identity and occupation as followers of Jesus had all but vanished overnight. All of their daily routines, plans, and connections changed in that instant. And their grief would have been immense in this loss. Second, his death called into question everything they had understood about who Jesus was or who they wanted him to be. The Jewish Messiah they envisioned was a victorious conqueror who would save them in their immediate circumstances. And under Roman rule, they desperately wanted saving from the oppression that made their lives painful and difficult. So his death meant much more than the loss of a loved one. It shook up everything they had been investing in, believing in, and hoping in for the past three years. In addition to their grief and possibly confusion about what this meant for Jesus' claims of being the Messiah, it also put them at risk. The fervor leading to Jesus' execution had been intense, and the disciples were known followers of Jesus. So hiding behind locked doors was a response to a real threat to their safety, They had seen what had happened to him. So there they were, as secure as they could make themselves, which in the grand scheme of things might not have been all that secure if an angry mob had figured out their location and wanted in badly, but it was presumably the best they could do, wondering if or when they would be discovered and figuring out their next steps. Verses 19 and Uh, Yeah, verse 19 itself reads, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. So suddenly, in the middle of their quaking huddle, there he is, offering a greeting that's both standard and profound all at the same time. Peace be with you. On the one hand, it's an everyday social script, not much different than how are you or take care, and yet it says everything about the moment, who he is and what he offers them. The phrase is repeated by Jesus twice on this occasion and again when he meets Thomas a week later. Our common greetings and farewells are often ways of voicing what we wish for another person. And since we can't predict the future and have no power to control circumstances, Wishing is all we, as humans, can do. But when Jesus steps into the room, he doesn't just wish them peace, he brings it. He is it. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord, says verse 20. And again, there are a couple of reasons for this. First, there's the obvious delight at learning their dearest friend and leader, presumed dead, was actually alive. Consider the initial weeks and, uh, after that loss of someone beloved. The dream state of knowing on one level it's true that they're gone, but the feeling like it's not real, so maybe they'll walk in the door at any moment. The time during which you sense exactly what it would feel like if that did happen. 
Some of you might have even experienced a feeling like that after waking up from a nightmare that felt really real. And after some moments of horror, realizing to your greatest relief it had all been a dream and that the one you love is still with you, imagine the indescribable flood of relief and profound joy when that's actually the case. Beyond this, though, proof of Jesus' life is proof that peace has been achieved. And this peace is more than a temporary political peace brought on through the victory of a human hero, hero, the kind of Messiah the Jews or the disciples may have been picturing. It's an ultimate eternal peace that can't be overturned by any kind of government or other forces. The disciples knew that Jesus had been dead. They'd witnessed and confirmed it. His resurrection put all the pieces together. Everything he'd explained about himself that they hadn't understood was right there in front of them. So their joy comes from much more than seeing Jesus alive. It's bubbling up from the understanding that he is indeed the Messiah. And his greeting of peace is far more significant than a polite formality. He repeats the greeting twice more, once um, a week later when he appears to Thomas, who wasn't present the night Jesus came to the other disciples in the locked room. Let's look at that again. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas gets some extra attention here, and he's the poster child for lack of faith. But from the beginning of the resurrection day, various degrees of doubt and confusion are experienced by most of the participants. The women at the tomb are initially confused about what's happened to Jesus' body, and the other disciples can't make sense of what the women are telling them. Locked away that evening, they're grieving and frightened, and they are surprised when Jesus joins them. And although Jesus commends faith that doesn't depend on seeing, throughout the passage, he's also gracious confirming his identity and bringing peace through his presence, even if people were wondering and questioning at first. He understands the humanness of his followers and their need for some reassurance. Indeed, as John closes the chapter in the book, he explains his goal of offering evidence of who Jesus is so that anyone reading or hearing John's words will understand and believe so that peace will be with them as well. It says in verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That life in his name, because he overcame death and came back offering peace. And while I do hope that knowing this offers an internal sense of peace for you, it's so much more than a feeling. It is a fact that remains true even as our feelings come and go for better or for worse. The Greek word used here for peace is irene, and I may be pronouncing that wrong. As Hugh Welshall explains, while it sometimes suggests peaceful conduct toward others, the New Testament's use of irene is more encompassing. Like shalom in the Old Testament, it includes a broad vision of human flourishing with a New Testament emphasis on God's saving work through Jesus Christ. Irene is defined and described by Precept Austin as being to join or bind together that which has been separated. Literally pictures the binding or joining together again of which that which had been separated or divided and thus setting at one again, a meaning conveyed by the common expression of having it all together. While death had given the disciples a momentary taste of separation from Jesus, from peace, thankfully death nor locked doors were enough to keep that division where God intended oneness and completeness. Jesus' presence in that room fulfilled the promise of wholeness, harmony, and life that characterizes the peace he offers. Going back in the passage to verse 21, Jesus repeats the assurance of peace to the disciples on Easter evening, this time as part of an instruction. Again, Jesus said, 
peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now that peace has been achieved and fear has been displaced. It's time to unlock the doors and live out in the open. And that's what Jesus is instructing his disciples to do. Fear needs to be exchanged for boldness so that with the Holy Spirit's help, others can be told about and offered this peace as well. The peace of Jesus' presence and resurrection will enable the disciples to go out confidently, with nothing to lose, to share the joy that's for everyone. In fear and doubt, they hid, and now, in peace and joy, they emerge out into the open, and theirs is a remarkable transformation. Heading into the book of Acts, which is quite an exciting book if you just kind of read it all through, it's evident that Jesus' peace goes with them as they are sent out. In Acts 5, the followers of Jesus face trial in front of the religious leaders. They have been told to stop teaching about Jesus and are in serious trouble for disregarding those instructions. In verse 29, Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. They had accepted their part in spreading peace at this point and were now willing to risk immediate safety to make sure others had the same chance as they had been offered to look forward to a future of forever peace. And we're asked to do the same. As the Bible project expresses, Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I made to be but have failed to be, and now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or our world. So what does this look like? during this time in which we wait for the complete and final restoration of peace? How do we create peace in the broken parts of our lives, relationships, and world? In our own lives and relationships, peace may be psychological or healing, um, healing relational wounds, building emotional maturity and well-being, ensuring that we're offering and have people in our lives where we experience trust and safety. It may mean growing in faith and knowledge of God and our identity in him. And even addressing practical barriers to peace, like improved stewardship of health and financial resources. From a place of good personal and relational wholeness and peace, we can look outward toward our communities and society. The organization Vision of Humanity describes themselves as having a focus on peace, looking at the major issues of today in a balanced and positive light. They identify eight pillars of positive peace that have been shown to be associated with peaceful societies. These include things like functional government, equitable distribution of resources, human rights, good relationships with neighbors, access to information, education, and low corruption. As part of communities, we can participate and advocate for this kind of social peace that points toward a vision of God's kingdom on earth. And through all of this investment, we can connect our actions to our mission, sharing the joyful news of God's peace through Jesus' death and resurrection so that others can share in it. And we can do that because Jesus' peace and presence moves us from fear and doubt to joy and boldness in living out in the open and sharing the good news. In the words of Psalm 118, 14 to 17 that we heard earlier, the Lord is my strength and defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. So, as we go today, let's not waste any time. Let's not keep it to ourselves. 
Eastertide reminds us to celebrate. So let's do just that, right out in the open, with nothing to hide and everything to rejoice in. Amen. Before we begin our congregational prayer, I would draw everyone's attention. Oh, we got a hymn. We'll get that hymn in first. As our hymn of response, we're going to do number 377, New Earth, Heavens New in its entirety. Um, with our previous hymnal, we had an accompaniment version that we sometimes did. With this new hymnal, there's a new accompaniment that is a little more jazzy that we're going to try today. So uh, please stand with me to sing, just to let you know there is an introduction and then there isn't a bit of an interlude between each verse, but we'll get through it. <laughs>
know about everybody else, but I liked that. That was nice. Now, before we begin our congregational prayer, I would draw everyone's attention to the items on our communion table. A bowl of water, a basket of pebbles, and a basket of green cedar. Water is the very essence of life. It nourishes us, replenishes our body, and sustains life. It's one of God's greatest gifts. The pebbles represent our sorrows and our concerns, the green cedar, our joys and our blessings. As we pray together our congregational prayer, you're invited to come forward and place a pebble or a cedar green into the water and lift a silent prayer to the Lord. Let us pray. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all God's creation. We pray, holy God, for the church universal, for the unity of the church, for Mennonite churches along the breadth of Canada, for churches of all denominations, our brothers and sisters in Christ, O God, our sanctuary, guide and direct us all. We pray, O omnipotent God, for the well-being of all creation, for the will and wisdom to care for the earth, for the creatures, both human and of your vast creation, being radically affected by climate change, pollution, and loss of habitat, habitat and creatures that teeter on the edge of extinction. O oh God, rainbow of promise, preserve the earth, we pray. We pray and empower us with the courage and wisdom to take affirmative action. We pray, righteous God, for peace and justice in this world, for efforts towards international cooperation for peace in the Ukraine, Middle East, Myanmar, and all areas of war and conflict. O oh God, sovereign and judge, guide the nations and those in power. We pray, benevolent God, for the poor, those oppressed, sick, bereaved, or lonely for the hungry and the homeless, for persons without family or friends. O oh God, shepherd of all, attend those in need. We lift up to you, compassionate God, all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, for those in hospitals and other institutions of care, for those who have no medical care, O oh God, healer of all, wrap them in your loving embrace and store to, restore to them their health. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Beth will now lead us in our sending hymn. Stand with me to sing number 830, Go My Children, number 830.
As today's service has been about peace, I would like everyone to turn to their neighbor and pass the peace with them by saying, peace be with you. And you can re receive it with, and also unto you. As you go forward, look up. As you go forward, look out. As you go, fo go forward, share Christ's peace in a world of need. Go in peace. <laughs>